Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to continue our conversation with our fifth video about the immune system. Today we're going to talk about adaptive immunity. So what happens when T cells and B cells join the fight against the infection? So stay tuned. So as I said in the intro, today we're going to be talking about the adaptive immune system, and we're going to pick up where we left off. So where we left off, we had dendritic cells roaming around in the lymph nodes, and they were activating helper T cells and potentially killer T cells, depending on the nature of the infection. That process is known as clonal selection, because we're identifying which T cell clones are going to be needed to aid in fighting off this infection. The next step after clonal selection is a process called clonal expansion. So clonal expansion uh, refers to what happens after T cell activation. Those T cells are going to begin to replicate through the process of mitosis, and they will also begin to differentiate. So what I mean by differentiate is that not all T cells are created the same. So it turns out that when a helper T cell or a killer T cell becomes activated, they will begin to divide, making copies of that cell which are identical to itself. In other words, the T cell receptor on the surface of all of the daughter cells of the originally activated T cell will be identical. They will recognize the same cognate antigen. But their jobs may be different. So for example, if we look at killer T cells, Killer T cells are going to differentiate into a couple different types of killer T cell. The first, they can divide and become more killer T cells. These are the killer T cells that are going to go into the tissues. They'll circulate throughout the body looking for their cognate antigen and looking for virally infected cells and helping to destroy them. But a small subsection of those killer T cells that will be produced through this clonal expansion process will become century or central memory CD8 positive T cells. In other words, they are memory killer T cells, and they're going to linger around in the lymphoid organs with the job of being reactivated should, those, should that cognate antigen reappear. In other words, if this infection reappears at another point later in this individual's life, those killer T cells can be, those central memory killer T cells can be reactivated and begin to reinitiate the fight against that viral pathogen. On the other hand, helper T cells can differentiate into a number of different cells. First and foremost, a, a helper T cell can differentiate into another helper T cell, just as you would expect. However, unlike with killer T cells, there are actually different subclasses of, of helper T cells that have different jobs. So, for example, a helper T cell can become a type 1 helper T cell or a Th1. Th1 cells are very good at releasing cytokines such as interferon and TNF, when they get to the tissue. And in the tissue, this is very good at stimulating or, or hyper-stimulating um, um, macrophages, stimulating uh, and activating dendritic cells and, and other cells like natural killer cells that are present in the tissue. So they're great, consequently, at helping your body fight off viral and bacterial pathogens. There's also another class called a Th2. Uh, this subclass is particularly active in fighting against parasitic infections, things like worms. Uh, the reason why is they are very good at, at secreting the proper cytokines needed to get, uh, to get uh, the immune cells in the tissue, good at fighting off these multicellular pathogens. But when they help to activate B cells, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, they're very good at making those B cells produce the proper types of antibodies that are needed to fight off these infections, particularly IgE and IgA antibodies. We'll talk about what those different classes of antibodies do for us later on in this conversation. There's also a type of helper T cell called a Th17, and Th17s are particularly good at secreting a cytokine called interleukin-17. In, in this particular uh, subclass of helper T cell is typically activated in response to, uh, to fungal infections. Th17 is really, really good at activating and causing neutrophils to diapodese through the blood vessels into the tissue. This is hugely important because these neutrophils are going to be essential for your body to fight off these fungal infections. Again, uh, this is also good at causing the B cells that they, that they co-stimulate to produce the proper types of antibodies needed to fight off these infections as well. Now, how does a helper T cell actually make the decision about whether to differentiate into a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17? Well, it turns out that that information is actually provided by the dendritic cell. So remember, the dendritic cell is going to be collecting all of that battlefield antigen at the battle scene before it hops into the lymphatic vessel and travels to the lymph node. Well, it turns out that 
uh, depending on which PAMPs are bound by uh, are bound to those particular antigens, that will actually trigger a response within the dendritic cell. So for example, the PAMPs that might be activated, or the PRRs that are activated in response to lipopolysaccharide from bacteria will be different than those activated by, say, uh, viral antigens such as protein, viral protein spikes or viral DNA or RNA. As a result, as that dendritic cell is traveling through the lymphatic vessel in the lymph node, they will actually undergo a change and begin secreting different cytokines depending on which PRRs are activated at the battle scene. That The secretion of those cytokines will then actually influence which type of helper T cell is being produced through this differentiation process. So dendritic cells activated, for example, by bacterial and viral antigens will actually be able to trigger production of Th1 cells, whereas dendritic cells whose PRRs were activated in response to, say, a fungal pathogen will help to lead to the production of Th17 cells. This is very interesting because it is uh, one example of the innate immune system informing the adaptive immune system not only to the presence of an invader, but what type of invader is actually present to begin with. Now, of course, there's also the ability of these helper T cells to differentiate into a central memory helper T cell or a CD4, CD4 positive central memory T cell. These, of course, will hang around in the secondary lymphoid organs waiting to re-encounter their cognate antigen should it reappear. And this is the same lineage. The helper T cell can also give rise through this differentiation process into regulatory T cells. Remember, Tregs are those helper T cells that will actually go to the tissue uh, towards the end of an infection and help to turn the immune response off. So let's talk about next what happens to these cells. Where are T cells actually going to go? Well, if you're a killer T cell, the answer is pretty simple. You are going to hop into the bloodstream and you're going to travel to spots of inflammation and get into the tissue and help to aid the fight by getting rid of virally infected cells. Helper T cells have a lot of places they can go. So helper T cells, uh, there are different three basic definite destinations that a, an activated helper T cell will end up going to. So helper T cells, one, will go to the tissue. So they are going to, again, like the killer T cells, travel through the blood vessels, leave the blood vessels at spots of inflammation, get into the tissue, and help to aid in uh, aid in the fight that's going on in the tissue by secreting cytokines, and those are the cytokines that will help to re-stimulate macrophages, continue to cause natural killer cells and, and neutrophils to aid in the fight, keep that dendritic cells activated so that they can continue to collect battle antigen and hopefully uh, activate future uh, T cells in response to this particular infection. Another example of where a T cell or a helper T cell might go is what I call the tour de lymph. So helper T cells have a lot of responsibilities. One of them, as we'll talk about in just a minute, is to activate B cells. Well, in order to do that, they need to travel throughout the lymphatic system. So some of these helper T cells are going to travel throughout the lymphatic system and kind of visit every possible lymphoid organ that they can in the process of doing so, looking for B cells that they can help to co-stimulate, which is a requirement for most B cell activation. The third place that T cells, helper T cells are going to go is they're going to stay within the same lymph lymphoid organ, but they're going to travel uh, to a different part of that lymphoid organ to participate in the activation of B cells. I want you to hold that thought because we're not quite at B cells yet. We will get there and we will see how and why helper T cells are so important for activating B cells. First, let's talk about what happens to those helper T cells that go to the tissue. Helper T cells that go to the tissue, as I mentioned before, are very important. They are the quarterbacks of the immune system. So when they get to the tissues, they're going to secrete cytokines, that things like interferon gamma, things like TNF, things that are able to make macrophages and dendritic cells and neutrophils and natural killer cells continue to do their jobs while they're in the tissue. But when a helper T cell gets to the tissue, the first thing it needs to do before it goes about doing its job is undergo a process called re-stimulation. In other words, a helper T cell needs to re-encounter its cognate antigen at the battle scene for a couple reasons. First and foremost, activated T cells constantly need to be reassured that what they're doing is the correct thing. I like to say that helper T cells have low self-esteem. They need to constantly be reassured that they are that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So a helper T cell gets the tissue, the first thing it's going to try to do is re-encounter its cognate antigen. In other words, it needs to go through another round of antigen presentation. Now there are dendritic cells in the tissue, but they're kind of busy doing something else. The cell that's in the tissue that's most likely to re-stimulate a helper T cell is the macrophage. Remember we talked about antigen presenting cells. We talked about three antigen presenting cells. And we've already talked about the activity of the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell is the professional antigen presenting cell that hops into the lymphoid vessel, goes to the lymph node, and was responsible for activating this helper T cell at the initial, at the, at the outset. 
Now it's going to come the time of the macrophage. Macrophages also produce MHC class 2 receptors. And while they've been going about phagocytosing all of these cells and breaking them down and excreting the waste, some of, the, of that, that antigen, some of those peptides that they've been ingesting, have been being packaged into MHC2 displays and stuck on the outside of the cell. Remember that activated macrophages, not hyperactivated, but activated macrophages are very, very good at antigen presentation. So what's going to happen is when that helper T cell arrives at the tissue, it's going to go in search of antigen presenting macrophages that might be able to provide it with its cognate antigen. And if that happens, that dendritic cell, I'm sorry, that macrophage and that helper T cell will undergo another round of antigen presentation. That macrophage will provide the same B7 protein uh, to interact with that, with that helper T cell and re-stimulate it. And that helper T cell will go about its business secreting cytokines to keep macrophages and dendritic cells and all those other cells fighting the battle. Should that, have, should that helper T cell re reach the tissue and not encounter its cognate antigen, or later on in the infection, if it can't be re-stimulated because there's no more of its cognate antigen around, over time, those helper T cells will slowly undergo the process of apoptosis and remove themselves from the battle scene. This is actually a good normal process, right? Because if the helper T cell can no longer be re-stimulated by its cognate antigen, it means that its particular role in the battle is over. It could mean that the battle is over altogether, but it could mean that that particular pathogen that it was activated by is no longer present. In other words, we don't need it anymore. And this is a good thing because we do not want immune responses carrying on longer than they need to. Killer T cells also have a requirement for re-stimulation, but they're going to get it in a different way. Remember, killer T cells read MHC1 displays. They're interested in what a cell is producing because they're looking for virally infected cells. So when a killer T cell diapodesis through the, through the blood vessel makes it into the tissue, it's going to try to be re-stimulated by finding self cells, the body's own cells that are presenting its cognate antigen in its MHC1 receptors. That's because that would be a cell that's infected with a virus. Should it encounter a cell that presents its, its cognate antigen, it will then begin to secrete enzymes such as perforin and granzymes. These will actually punch holes in the cell's plasma membrane, and it will actually secrete the granzymes into the cell, and this will begin to trigger the apoptotic cascade, causing that cell to undergo the process of cell suicide that is essential for helping to rid the body of the virus. There's also another way that a killer T cell can actually cause a cell to undergo uh, apoptosis. It's, the, presen it's the, the presence of a protein called FASL in its plasma membrane. Uh, and this FASL fits on a FAS receptor on the surface and acts as a death signal, causing that cell to undergo apoptosis. Remember, apoptosis is the preferred way that a virally infected cell removes itself from the body because when that cell sort of implodes and begins to degrade itself from the inside out, it will also chew up all the viral material that's inside and prevent the virus from spreading from cell to cell. Over time, the, these T cells will begin to encounter less and less of their cognate antigen and the battle, as the tide of the battle is slowly turned and the body begins to fight off this infection, hopefully, right? Well, as this happens, more and more of those helper T cells and killer T cells will begin to remove themselves from the body through the process of apoptosis. Now, remember uh, that about 10% of these will actually linger. They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to be those tissue resident memory T cells that will remain in the tissues on patrol looking for the present, the return of whatever antigen activated, activated them in the first place. They're going to provide one of the first responses that the body has uh, in, in case of uh, affection and infection re-emerging. This process will occur slowly at first as those T cells begin to get, undergo apoptosis. Uh, and then eventually those regulatory T cells will begin to show up in the tissue and they will speed this process up. Remember, we use the analogy of a car slowing down. So as those T cells slowly begin to die due to lack of re-stimulation, that's your foot letting off the gas pedal. And then when those regulatory T cells show up, that is your foot pressing the brakes and stopping the immune response. So that's the T cell branch of your adaptive immune system. What about B cells? So in order to talk about B cells and how they get activated, which is in a manner that's different than T cells, well, slightly different, they share some commonalities. We have to learn a little bit about the architecture of the lymphatic organ. So it turns out that T cells and B cells, while they're both present in the lymph node, is they are not located in the same part. T cells reside in an inner portion of the lymph node called the pericortex, whereas B cells reside in an outer portion called the cortex. And more specifically, B cells reside in these little compartments or little areas of the cortex known as the lymphoid follicle. Now, the lymphoid follicle is an important part of the lymph node, not only because it's where B cells live, but it's also where another type of cell that is responsible for B cell activation resides. These are called the follicular dendritic cells, or FDCs. Now, FDCs are superficially similar to the dendritic cells that traffic between 
the uh, between the tissue and the lymph nodes to activate T cells. But that similarity is only superficial. They're actually from different line uh, cell lineages. And in fact, unlike D cell, D, uh, dendritic cells, which are continuously produced by your body, most of your follicular dendritic cells are already in place by the time that you're actually born. So if you think about a lymphoid follicle, I want you to picture it this way. Picture uh, a bunch of follicular dendritic cells as islands. And they're these little sort of starfish shaped islands surrounded by a sea of B cells. And it's these B cells that we're interested in activating. But in order for a B cell to be activated, there are a few steps that they're going to have to go through. The first step in B cell activation is actually for that B cell with its B cell receptor to recognize its cognate antigen. But unlike what we see with T cells, where its antigen is brought to it by a dendritic cell, B cells sit in the lymphoid follicle and wait for its antigen to actually move directly towards it. So how does this happen? Well, B cells recognize their cognate antigen with their B cell receptor on the surface of an FDC. Now, this poses, th this poses actually a very interesting question. How could a follicular dendritic cell actually bind to all the billions of potential antigens that can be present in your body? Well, there are a couple of ways that this could happen. Let's, let's use one potential way that this could possibly happen. We could imagine that follicular dendritic cells could produce a receptor, not unlike the way that B cell receptors and T cell receptors are produced through this sort of uh, recombination and producing very specialized receptors. And each of these receptors recognizes a different potential antigen and we get this whole process happening. But if you think about it, that doesn't make a ton of sense. Evolutionarily, it's not a good idea. The main reason why is if you go through this process, first off, it's very, very inefficient and energetically consuming. Remember, like one in 30 B cells actually makes it through this process, and the odds are even worse if you're a T cell. So that's not great. The other problem is, is if you do this process for FTCs, you have to have as many follicular dendritic cells in the body as you do B cells and T cells. And that in and of itself is yet another problem. So let's try a different approach. What if instead of binding to something very specifically, what if it binds to something quite non-specifically? In fact, what if it uses something that's already very present in very high numbers within the body and binds to that instead? Let's go back to that protein system called complement. Remember, complement opsonizes pretty much anything of a foreign origin that enters your body. And a lot of this stuff is going to get flushed into the lymph and travel through the lymphatic vessel and travel through the lymph nodes. And that's exactly what the FDC does. Follicular dendritic cells actually have protein receptors on their surface that bind to complement. So you imagine you have complement attached on one end to pretty much anything it could be attached to. And on the other end, that is what's bound by the follicular dendritic cell receptors. So complement is not only important for opsonizing material at the battlefield so that it can be targeted by your own body, but follicular, but but complement opsonized antigen is also essential for it to actually land on the surface of an FDC and is therefore essential for the activation of B cell receptors. Remember I told you complement is a super important protein system you've never heard of. This is another reason why. For the most part, without complement's activities, you would not get activation of naive B cells at any point in your body. Now, if you think about this, this is very, very analogous to what happens with the dendritic cell though. See, when it comes to T cell activation, the, the dendritic cell provides information from the body that this particular thing it's presenting to whatever T cell it's presenting to is harmful, it's dangerous. Remember, all of those antigens that are being presented by that dendritic cell at one point or another bound to a pathogen recognition receptor, which means they came from a potential pathogen, which means your innate immune system has already vetted it as being a problem. Therefore, only problems are presented to your T cells. Well, well complement only binds to foreign things. Therefore, if something is opsonized by complement, your innate immune system has, again, already vetted it as being a problem. That is a very analogous step. And the first step in B cell activation is very similar to the first step in T cell activation. You need the BCR to recognize its complement, its cognate antigen. There's that specificity again. Now, the second step is actually different. See, so remember the second step of T cell activation involved either a CD4 or a CD8 co-receptor interacting with whichever its comp complementary MHC was on the surface of the dendritic cell. There's no need for that for B cells. So the main reason why is this. T cells, because of their position in the body, and as well as the fact that they can interact with lots of different cells, foreign and self, they need to have that validation step of, yep, this is one of my own cells, and yes, I'm allowed to be activated in response to this. This is an antigen-presenting cell, or this is one of my own cells that can provide information. B cells don't have that issue. 
B cells don't really go anywhere. They kind of have one friend, and their one friend is the follicular dendritic cell. So because complement has to bind first, and then that complement then has to bind to the receptor on the FDC, that vetting process of this is the right information is already met by the fact that it's on the surface of the FDC, the B cell's one and only friend. So we don't need that CD step, but we do need the second step, which is something called cross-linking. So if you remember with T cells, the third step of T cell activation was a question of abundance. Is there enough of my cognate antigen to bind enough of my T cell receptors to activate me? The same thing is true of B cells. There has to be enough of that cognate antigen present on the FTC to activate enough of that B cells, B cell receptors to warrant activation. This is referred to as cross-linking in, in B cells. And the reason why is in that narrow space where the plasma membrane of the B cell comes in contact with the plasma membrane of the follicular dendritic cell, what will happen is as that B cell is recognized as cognate antigen, more and more of those B cells are going to migrate to that point of connection between the two cells. In fact, you'll get so many of those receptors there that it almost looks like they're one globular mass of one giant protein. It almost looks like they're chemically linked to each other. They're not, but that looks like in, in biochemical terms is called cross-linking. This cross-linking is essential because it demonstrates that that B cell is absolutely needed for this infection. There is an abundance of its cognate antigen present in this particular infection, and therefore the antibodies this B cell could potentially produce are extremely helpful to the system. Aided in this is the fact that B cell receptors also have, a, or B cells also have a complement receptor. So in other words, not only are they recognizing their cognate antigen with their B cell receptor, they're also recognizing the presence of complement attached to that cognate antigen as well. And this can aid in the cross-linking process. The third requirement for B cell activation, again, is analogous to what happens with T cells. It's co-stimulation. Remember that B7 protein interacting with the CD28 protein on the surface of that, de of, of that helper T cell is essential for its co-stimulation. But in this case, B cells, most B cells require co-stimulation from a different cell. It's not going to come from the follicular dendritic cell. Instead, it needs to come from a helper T cell. And not just any helper T cell. It needs to come from a helper T cell who recognizes the same cognate antigen as it does. Now, this poses two very important questions. First off, how in the world are we going to find a B cell and a T cell that both recognize the same cognate antigen? And also, I thought you said that B cells and T cells don't actually live in the same place, so how are they even going to talk to each other? Well, we'll answer those questions in sequence. First, let's talk about how B cells and helper T cells get together. So when a T cell, a helper T cell and a B cell are freshly activated, that is going to re, that's going to, uh, that's going to cause some changes inside of the cell. They're going to begin producing different receptors and these different receptors are going to allow them to respond to certain chemokines that they previously couldn't interact with. These chemokines will actually draw the helper T cells towards the border of the pericortex and the cortex. It will also draw those newly activated B cells quite rapidly to that same region of the lymph node. And this is important because if a B cell doesn't receive co-stimulation within an hour or two, it will undergo apoptosis. Freshly activated B cells are actually quite fragile and need to rapidly be co-stimulated in order to survive. So the next question is this. Okay, let's say we get a bunch of helper T cells and a bunch of newly activated B cells together. How are they going to know that they're talking about the same antigen? We have to go back to our conversation about class 2 MHC2s again, or class 2 MHC receptors again. Remember I said there are three cells that can function in antigen presentation. We've already talked about the dendritic cell in a previous video. We talked about the macrophage a few minutes ago, and now it's the B cell's turn. So when a B cell recognizes its cognate antigen on the surface of a follicular dendritic cell, it doesn't go, hey, that's cool, and then walk away. It actually ingests it. It ingests that material, it brings it in, it packages it into MHC2 receptors, pushes it to its surface as it's migrating to that border between the cortex and the pericortex. And once it gets there, it basically redoes the process that the dendritic cell does. It wanders around talking to all of the available helper T cells and say, do you recognize this cognate antigen? Do you recognize this cognate antigen? And if that helper T cell recognizes its cognate antigen in the MHC receptors on the surface of that B cell, they will both know that they're talking about the same cognate antigen and that helper T cell will, will co-stimulate that B cell. So this interaction is actually uh, bi-directional. They're both going to provide each other with information and change the way those two cells behave from that point forward. 
First off, you're gonna end up with something called CD40L that is produced by the helper T cell that will fit into a CD40 receptor on the surface of the B cell. That's the co-stimulatory step. That's what's gonna provide the final step in the activation of that B cell and lead to clonal expansion. At the same time, that B cell is going to provide the B7 protein that initially activated that help that initially co-stimulated that helper T cell. This is gonna cause the helper T cell to change too. It is actually going to now become a full-blown follicular helper T cell or a TFH. And these TFHs are actually gonna move into the lymphoid follicle where they can provide where they can continue to provide co-stimulation and re-stimulation for those newly born B cells that are about to occur as a result of the process of clonal expansion. So what will happen now is those B cells, just like we saw with the T cells, they'll undergo a process of clonal expansion where they will begin to replicate themselves through mitosis and they will begin to differentiate into different types of B cells. This, of course, will require the co-stimulation by those, uh, uh, those follicular uh, helper T cells that are around. At this point, this rapid uh, expansion of the B cell population is going to transform that follicle. It'll actually be known as either a secondary follicle or more appropriately, a germinal center within that lymph node. This particular part of the lymph node is actually going to swell, uh, uh, swell greatly at this point as those cells begin to uh, accumulate within that particular lymph node. Now, B cells don't have quite the variety of, of, of cell fates that helper T cells do. Uh, the majority of the cells that are going to be produced through this clonal expansion process are simply going to be short-lived plasma B cells. And these are the ones that are going to travel throughout the lymph node and the body, uh, secreting thousands of antibodies per second uh, into, the, into the system in order to help fight off the infection. A select few of these will actually be long-lived plasma B cells. These are the ones that will go to the bone marrow and continue to secrete low levels of antibodies long after this infection has passed. These are actually a form of memory B cell. There will also be central memory B cells, and central memory B cells are actually going to hang out inside of the lymphoid organs where they will continue to proliferate at slow, uh, slow levels uh, and to replenish those long-lived B cells as they begin to, those long-lived plasma B cells as they begin to age and die. The other thing I want to talk about is the fact that not all B cells have to undergo T cell dependent activation. About 1% of B cells that are activated are activated in a B cell independent manner. And these are activated by antigens known as super antigens. Super antigens are typically carbohydrates or fats that are found on the surface of, of many bacterial pathogens or in some cases, uh, enveloped viruses. This is important because uh, super antigens are able to activate B cells by cross-linking an enormous amount of B cell receptors so that they can actually bypass that requirement for co-stimulation from a helper T cell. This is because carbohydrates and many of these fats actually have a lot of repetitive moieties in them. Remember that we talked about the fact that B cells uh, only bind to a, a certain portion of its cognate antigen. B cell receptors do. It's called their epitope. Well, if you have a single carbohydrate that has the same epitope over and over and over and over again, a single carbohydrate could actually cross an enormous amount of B cell receptors on the surface of a B cell and bypass that requirement for T cell, T cell dependent activation. This is actually really cool. And the reason why is this, it allows your immune system to rapidly respond to antigens that aren't proteins. Remember, MHC1s and MHC2s, which are needed for activating T cells, only present proteins, small peptides. So if you want a carbohydrate or a lipid to activate B cells, it can't come through a T cell dependent pathway. It'll never be the same cognate antigen. Instead, this ability of these things to function as super antigens allows your body to begin rapidly activating and producing antibodies against non-proteinaceous antigens, which is really cool and it turns out is really important, particularly for fighting off encapsulated bacterial infections. Encapsulated bacteria often have capsules that consist of either fats or carbohydrates that often act as super antigens. And B cell or T cell independent activation of B cells turns out is really, really important for fighting off these uh, infections caused by encapsulated bacteria. Now, where are these B cells going to end up going? Uh, well, as I said, the majority of these are going to begin to circulate in the system as plasma B cells, and then we'll have those, uh, we'll have those uh, central memory B cells that are going to reside in the spleen that can be reactivated uh, by a, a future reoccurrence of this particular infection. Here's another interesting fact. A lot of these central memory B cells that will be reactivated in response to a, to a recurrence of this infection reside in the spleen. 
One of the things that's interesting is these are most easily activated by those super antigens. And it turns out that individuals who lack a spleen are actually much more susceptible to encapsulated bacterial infections simply because they don't respond quite as fast to these particular super antigens because they're missing the lymphoid organ where the majority of these central memory B cells actually reside. So as I mentioned before, the vast majority of B cells that are produced are going to be some type of plasma B cell whose job it is, is to secrete antibodies. Now, the thing to realize is this, regardless of what type of plasma B cell you are, plasma B cells can only produce one type of antibody. They can only produce an antibody that recognizes the same cognate antigen as its BCR. And the reason for this is simple. It's because an antibody is nothing more than a secreted version of its B cell receptor. So a B cell that gets activated will only produce antibodies against the cognate antigen that activated it. Now, all descendants of that originally activated cell that occurred through clonal expansion will have the exact same B cell receptor and thus the exact same produce the exact same antibodies. But there is actually a way that your body is able to fine tune some of these antibodies to actually make them more effective. The first way to do this is a process called somatic hypermutation. So if you recall, B cell receptors and antibodies, of course, are, are comprised of two parts. It's comprised of, a, of long chain immunoglobulins and short chain immunoglobulins. And these are, of course, encoded by genes. since These are proteins. It turns out that within these genes are regions that are highly, highly mutagenic. In other words, when these cells replicate themselves by the process of mitosis, one of the things that obviously has to happen is DNA replication. And within these regions of the variable region, the part that actually binds to the, the cognate antigen, there is a high level of mutation. As a result, each daughter cell of the original of, of every cell division has a slightly different version of that particular B cell receptor. Now it recognizes the same cognate antigen. It's not that different, but some of these B cell receptors that are produced by these daughter cells that are tweaked in such a way, they may actually be, they might actually be higher affinity. In other words, they recognize the same cognate antigen, but they do it better. They're more efficient at it. And as a result, when they go to be re-stimulated by, by the, help, the follicular helper T cells that are there, they'll actually be uh, re-stimulated at a higher rate because of their ability to bind st more strongly and more abundantly to their cognate antigen. What this means basically is over time, your body begins to produce B cells that produce better quality antibodies. So the further into an infection you go, the more this somatic hypermutation has occurred. And the end result is actually a refinement of those antibodies. So they recognize the same cognate antigen, but they actually do it better, which is really, really cool. The other thing that will happen in many cases is a process called class switching. So as I said before, uh, every B cell will produce an antibody that recognizes this cognate antigen, but it turns out that there are four major classes of antibodies. The part of an antibody that recognizes the cognate antigen is called the variable region. It's the region that varies from B cell to B cell to B cell. It's the part that's unique to that particular antibody. But there's also another portion called the constant region. And the constant region is called this is because within classes, it's identical regardless of which B cell produces it. So for example, all of the IgG antibodies that are produced by your body, the, the constant region of your IgG antibody is identical. On the other hand, the variable region is actually going to be quite different as you would like it to be that provides you with a wide array of antibodies that can target a huge array of potential pathogens. So we've got the, we got the variable region and we've got the constant region. When we talk about antibody classes, we're talking about changing the constant region of that particular antibody. And it turns out there are four different classes of antibodies, IgE, IgG, IgA, and IgM. And each of them are responsible for doing something different. There are pros and cons to each of them, and they're utilized by your body to fight off different types of infections in different parts of your body. And we'll talk about what those, what those antibodies can do for you in just a minute. First, let's broadly talk about how this is a, how class switching works. See, it turns out that initially all of your cell, all of your B cells, their first and default setting is to produce IgM antibodies. Now, IgM antibodies are great, and we'll talk about what they can do, but they're not the best type of antibody for, for every type of, of, of situation. So what can happen is when those, uh, when those helper T cells that are helping to re-stimulate and co-stimulate your B cells as they're being produced, they can actually influence which type of antibody or which class of antibody that particular B cell is going to produce. And this in turn is dependent on which type of helper T cell it is. Is it a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17? But remember, the fact that it's a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17 was influenced initially 
by what the dendritic cell informed that helper T cell of via cytokine release. So if we backtrack this, what this means is that that dendritic cell, when it traveled from the tissue, not only influenced what type of helper T cells it was going to activate, but indirectly influenced what type of antibodies should be produced in order to fight this infection. That means that the dendritic cell, even though it is an innate immune cell, is one of the smartest and most important cells in your body. It's not only influencing the types of T cells that are activated, but it's specifically determining which type of antibodies should be produced to fight off the infection. And antibodies are arguably your body's best weapon against any infection. So what do antibodies do that makes them so important? Well, there are five major things that antibodies do that actually help your body fight off infections. The first one is pretty, pretty easy to understand. It's called opsonization. It's the same thing that complement does. It binds to its cognate antigen on the surface of whatever cell it's targeting and basically alerts the body to the fact that there's a problem with this cell. It's virally infected. It's, it's, it's a bacterium. It's a fungal cell. Destroy this thing, whatever is attached to that antibody. It also turns out that antibody opsonized antigen later on in an infection can also bind to the surface of a follicular dendritic cells and help to re-stimulate or reactivate B cells later on in the infection. There's another process called agglutination. So agglutination is basically clumping. In other words, these antibodies will actually work together to clump together a bunch of different bacteria. It prevents them from, or, or viruses, it prevents them from moving around and they can be easily eliminated in certain parts of the body. There's a process called complement fixation. In other words, certain antibodies are very good at recruiting and activating the complement cascade. This again is very helpful in response to, for example, encapsulated bacteria. Encapsulated bacteria are often very challenged uh, are often a challenge for your body to optimize with complement. Complement doesn't bind well to them because they're kind of slippery. If an antibody, though, that recognizes some of those capsule materials is activated, it can bind to the capsule and then recruit complement to help begin forming membrane attack complexes and to attract other parts of your immune system to help destroy that thing. There's a process called neutralization. So neutralization is actually something we look for in vaccine trials, neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies, and particularly in viral infections, they bind to the surface of viruses, they bind to those spike proteins and other parts of that virus, and because they're bound by an antibody, they will not be taken up by your cell. In other words, they render that, they neutralize, they render that particular virus unable to infect your body. Hugely important. The last thing they do is something called an antitoxin. So there are certain pathogens such as tetanus or diphtheria or cholera that not necessarily kill you by having an abundant amount of bacteria in your body, but they kill you through the toxins that they produce. So antitoxins are antibodies that bind to specifically to that toxin and make it so that it falls out of your bloodstream or, does, or basically renders it useless. It can no longer get uh, activate whatever target it's supposed to or inhibit whatever target it was going to inhibit, and thus it prevents your body from being affected by the toxin. Very commonly when people are being treated uh, for tetanus or for, uh, for example, we give them an antitoxin, which is simply an antibody that goes around and helps you absorb all that toxin and prevents people from getting tetanus. So as I mentioned before, um, all of these different classes of antibodies are good at least one of these things, and they're typically not good at some of the other ones. So there is no one-size-fits-all class of antibody. So it's important that your body is able to produce different classes of antibodies, or at least your B cells are able to class switch between different classes of antibodies, so we can produce the proper type of antibody to help fight off whatever infection you have. So let's start at the top. Let's start it with IgM antibodies. Now, if you look at an IgM antibody, uh, it kind of looks like a bunch of IgG antibodies all kind of joined together. I think it's five of them uh, all in a row, sort of in a circular pattern. IgM antibodies are the first type of antibody produced by any activated B cell. And in fact, they're probably the first type of antibody to evolve invertebrates. The reason we know this is if you go back to very basal vertebrates, some of the earliest vertebrates that have an immune system to evolve, they produce one type of antibody. And when they produce one type of antibody, it's always an IgM antibody. Now, IgM antibodies are particularly good at one thing. They are outstanding at fixing complement. In other words, when they get involved, they're going to uh, activate the complement cascade on the surface of anything to which they bind. This is actually a great idea and a great evolutionary idea, if you will, uh, for IgMs to be the first type of antibody produced early on in an infection. If you think early on in an infection, do we have a ton of killer T cells roaming around or a ton of helper T cells roaming around? We don't. So instead, we produce IgM antibodies. They get secreted and they flow throughout the body and go to the scene of, of battles. And when they bind to something, they can recruit something that is already present in abundance. You can bet by the time that IgM antibodies are produced, 
that complement is going to be found in abundance at the scene of the battle. So there you go. An IgM antibody shows up, it fixes complement, and, and it, it helps to fight the infection that way. Now, IgMs are great, but there are lots of other types of antibodies that can be more helpful depending on the type of infection that we're having. The next one we'll talk about is the IgG antibody. So the IgG antibody is sort of the canonical antibody that we've seen all along throughout this process. You can see that an IgG antibody uh, is able to bind to two different, uh, two of its, comp uh, of its cognate antigens at the same time because it has two, uh, it's in the Y shape where it binds uh, at the two different uh, connections between the variable region. IgG antibodies are the most abundant and longest lived uh, antibodies in your bloodstream. So IgG antibodies can circulate in your bloodstream in high amounts for up to three weeks after an infection. Uh, and IgG antibodies are also very important because IgG antibodies are the ones that are produced by a mother and are able to pass across the placental barrier. So when the baby is in utero, it's the IgG antibodies produced by the mother that help protect the fetus from infections. Now, there are a couple different subclasses of IgG antibodies. There's an IgG1. So IgG1s are really good at opsonizing antigens. Uh, they're very good and useful for, uh, for combating um, for combating uh, viral and bacterial infections. IgG3 antibodies, on the other hand, are very good at fixing complement. Uh, so they're particularly helpful in a way similar to IgM antibodies. The next one we'll talk about is the IgE antibodies. So IgE antibodies are typically uh, activated in response uh, to parasitic infections uh, or fungal infections. So IgE antibodies are are important because uh, they are the ones that whose constant region is actually able to bind to the surface of mast cells uh, and other granulocytes. Um, but for that same reason, they are also the ones that are most interesting to allergists because they are the ones that are predominantly responsible for, uh, for atopic allergies and also trigger anaphylaxis. The main reason why is this. IgE antibodies are produced and they bind to the surface of those mast cells. Mast cells live for a very long time just under the tissue. And when they come in contact, when the Ig antibody binds to its cognate antigen, they will trigger degranulation of those mast cells. Now, this is nice and it's helpful if the thing that activated it is, for example, a worm or a fungus or something else that's problematic. It's very unhelpful if that IgG, the IgE antibody was produced in response to something uh, that is non-pathogenic, something like a peanut or bee venom. And that's what happens to people who have allergies. Instead of producing circulating antibodies like IgG uh, against those particular uh, allergens, they produce IgE antibodies. And these IgE antibodies coat the surface of mast cells, and they can live there for a very long time, years even. And should somebody come in contact again with that allergen, it will cause massive degranulation of their mast cells, and thus a very rapid and, and potentially fatal release of of inflammatory cytokines such as histamine and bradykinin that cause the anaphylactic reaction um, you know that will cause um, bronchoconstriction vasodilation uh, they can cause breathing passages and they can lead and even lead to things like hives uh, so it's potentially fatal so IgE antibodies while they are very useful in some contexts are also the major reason why people develop uh, atopic allergies uh, such as food allergies and drug allergies and hay fever the last type we'll talk about is the IgA antibody so IgA antibodies are actually the most abundant antibody in your entire body. So IgGs are the most abundant in the bloodstream, but IgAs have the important task of guarding everything that is a mucous membrane. So they are the antibodies that are secreted in, their muc in your mucus. They are the antibodies that coat your entire digestive tract. Ig and IgA antibodies have a very a unique structure. They look like two IgG antibodies uh, attached tail end to tail end. And they're attached by a little piece of protein called the clip. And this clip is hugely important. First off, it's what allows it to secrete itself into the gastrointestinal tract. It's also what protects that antibody from being digested by the, by the digestive enzymes that are located in your intestine. Now, uh, IgA antibodies are particularly good at one thing. They're great at agglutination. They can't fix common at all, but they're awesome at agglutination. In other words, what they do is they will, by existing in your mucous membranes, by existing in your digestive tract, they can bind to numerous different pathogens that are flowing through and cause them all to clump up. In a sense, this prevents them from attaching 
to the surfaces of your body, whether it's a sinus cavity or whether it's uh, the, the, the cells of your digestive tract, they, these cells can no longer attach themselves and begin to multiply and cause an infection. And basically they clump them up so that they can be removed from your body as a form of waste. It's, what, it's how they bind up these pathogens so they can be removed when you blow your nose. It's how they can be removed uh, when, when they come out in the form of feces. It's because of these IgA antibodies that protect your digestive tract. Now, IgA antibodies also have a very important role when it comes to newborns. See, IgG antibodies are the type of antibody that are secreted by mom across the placental barrier to help protect their, their baby when it's inside the womb. But it turns out it's the IgA antibodies that are essential for keeping the baby safe during the breastfeeding stages. So IgA antibodies are actually produced by the mom and secreted in the breast milk. And this makes a ton of sense evolutionarily because how are babies exposed to most of their pathogens? Babies tend to stick stuff in their mouth. They, they perceive their world almost entirely orally. So anything that's likely to cause an infection is likely to get in through the digestive tract. So it makes sense then that the IgA antibodies would be there to help protect that particular newborn from becoming infected. But this, asks, this begs the question, how does mom know what antibodies to produce? to keep their newborn healthy. And this goes to something that we've observed. It turns out that mothers love to kiss their babies. It turns out that most mothers, even animal mothers, love to kiss their babies. And the question was, why do moms kiss their babies? And yes, I know it's because they're adorable and cute and wonderful, but it turns out there's actually an evolutionary reason why you kiss your babies. Because when mothers kiss their babies, what they're doing is they are sampling the different microbes that are on the surface of their baby's skin, the ones that are most likely to cause an infection. And over time, at those, those, those pathogens are ingested. And within the next 24 to 48 hours, the mom mounts an immune response against those antigens. It produces those specific antibodies and secretes those IgA antibodies directly to the baby. So the reason why you kiss your newborns isn't just because they're cute. You kiss your newborns because that is the way your body knows how to best protect them. So the next question is, why do, why do dads kiss their babies? Well, it's because they're cute and adorable. We're not doing anything immunologically for them, but hey, they're adorable. So we kiss them too. But moms, go ahead and kiss your babies because that is how you are best providing them through your breast milk with the protection they need in order to survive for the first nine months or so before they have their own immune system and can fight off their own infections. Thank you so much for tuning in today to, to continue our conversation about the immune system. Today we talked about adaptive immunity. We talked about T cells and B cells, uh, how they get activated, what happens once they are activated. We talked about the different types of antibodies and how antibodies help protect our body. Next video, we'll talk about different types of immunity and how they arise in human beings. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys are learning a lot and I look forward to talking to you real soon. Bye.